Today, Chris and I are going to be talking about my favorite place, Pitt Meadows. So I thought I would give you a quick introduction to my beautiful city. Pitt Meadows is a part of a group of municipalities that make up the Greater Vancouver Regional District. We are situated about 40 to 45 minutes east of the city of Vancouver. We became a city on January 1st, 2007. We have approximately 19,512 people and a land mass of 86.34 kilometers. However, 78% of that is agricultural land. And we are protected by 60 kilometers of dikes due to being surrounded on three sides by rivers. Pitt Meadows is known as the natural place because it's so green and provides us with a lot of outdoor recreation. Our over 60 kilometers of dikes provides us with lots of options for walking, cycling, running, and access to the rivers for water sports like paddle boarding and kayaking. Our 78% of agricultural land is some of the richest agricultural land in Canada. We are large producers of blueberries and cranberries, but also have dairy farms and fresh cut flower farms. Something you're going to hear us talk a lot about is the Harris Road train crossing. That vertical red line is our main street, Harris Road. The line going across it in yellow is a CP rail line that cuts right through our town. Unfortunately, at this point, we wait about two hours every day at that train crossing. But a third line is being added, meaning we can wait up to seven hours a day at that train crossing. This includes people trying to get to work, people trying to make deliveries, and even our first responders. The current at-grade crossing has been identified as in the top 3% most dangerous crossings in Canada. What our city would like to see is an underpass that allows CP to continue their work without inhibiting the flow of traffic, cyclists, or pedestrians along the Harris Road corridor. Despite our issues with trains, we are truly a tight-knit, inclusive, vibrant community, and I truly believe Pitt Meadows is one of the most amazing places to call home. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. We sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada on this show. And over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today, we are honored to be sitting down with City of Pitt Meadows, British Columbia Councillor, Alison Evans. But before we do that, I want to take a moment and ask you to do a favor for me. If you can, hit that follow button. Hit that subscribe button if you're watching this on YouTube. That is a small gesture in making municipal issues matter again. Your subscribing to our show makes us understand that municipal issues are important to you. So please hit that follow button or subscription button. Now, on to our interview. Allison, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with me today and talking about the city of Pitt Meadows and yourself. But before we get started, I want to sort of ask a general question, but it's the basis of what the entire interview is about. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, yeah, just before we started, I just wanted to say that um, I'm coming today, uh, Zoom, from the traditional and unceded territory of the Kate C First Nation. And I just wanted to give thanks for the fact that I get to live, work, and play on their traditional territory. You know what? I, like, I, I, it's funny because I look back and I think that you could easily say that I was raised in a very, like, politically, like, it, my grandmother watched the news every night. Her and my dad would talk about it when she was visiting. And so they were always talking about politics. And my dad is actually, um, he was so engaged in municipal politics as a volunteer. He sat on numerous committees. He would go to council meetings, and, and I've spoken to the current New Westminster mayor, remembers my dad, at those council meetings. And unfortunately, when my dad passed away, it was quite sudden. It was, um, he knew I was going to run for council. Uh, we hadn't officially announced or really planned a campaign. But um, the, the council of the day actually did a little thing in council for him because um, he was so engaged. He was just a citizen who wanted to have his voice heard and would approach council all the time. So I think that those seeds were planted in me from a very young age. It sounds like, and I could be wrong <laughs> here, you wanted to follow in your father's footsteps, but you took it a step further and you actually put your name on the ballot. And I, I, I could be wrong and I could, I, I'm, I'm assuming here, and I should never assume, but I assume your father never put his name on the ballot to be a municipal no. councillor. Did he? 
No, he didn't. Um, he was on lots of committees, like and, and engaged and stuff. Um, I look back though, and there was definitely signs. Uh, in high school, I sat on student council as the grade representation, and um, you know, so there were times where I would in grade three, I got to interview the mayor, and I look back and I'm like, oh, those were all little signs that yeah, I was probably gonna go this route. I think that. I had his support, he would have been really, like, I think he would have been really, really proud. He would have um, been my number one. He probably would have driven to Pitt Meadows and come to our meetings. So, but yeah, it was it was pretty emotional. He passed away before I could um, announce officially my candidacy or, or sit or get elected. And um, his funeral was like two days after I had made my announcement. And so, um, I had a lot of people, I know it gets me really emotional, but I had a lot of people at his funeral and um, it kind of gave me the faith that I was doing the right thing because they said he had talked about it and, you know, he was proud. And I think that when I was inaugurated, he was a big part of getting me there. And um, growing up in the 80s, uh, I was, you know, a female, but he always treated me as like, I wasn't a princess. I was never his princess. I was his child and I could do anything. And he gave me that power that I have a voice at any table, that I could do whatever it is I wanted to do, as long as I put my mind to it. And then I would, you know, stay humble and kind and listen to people and how important it was to be municipally engaged and engaged in your community. What made you decide ultimately that 2022 was going to be the year that you put your name forward for municipal politics? Because it seems like you have a passion for what you're doing. You have a background for your a, a love of community. But in 2022, you made that final decision. Or in 2021, you made the decision to run in 2022. What was that based on at the end of the day? You know, it's funny because, um, you know, I, I'd been on committees and advisory committees too the the city and someone said to me would you ever consider running for council and it was kind of before I'd really made a concrete plan and I just thought well I don't know like who am I to to run for council and they actually kind of laid out my resume and my job qualifications and all these things like on paper for me and I went oh maybe that kind of makes sense so then the seed was planted and we had some really good discussions um my family my kids we, we really talked about what it would look like to be involved in a campaign. It is a very small city. Like we, you go to the grocery store, you see people, you know, and so it would be a big factor in, in our lives. And um, I worked previously, I worked part-time. Uh, so I was always at the school with my kids volunteering and stuff. And they knew that that meant a, a piece of their mom would be doing other things. And we had really good discussion about it about a year before the election. And then we kind of officially decided, I think it was Thanksgiving weekend, that as a family, we were in, we were going to do this. And it was, uh, it was everybody was in. So that was sort of, it was just, I, you know, somebody planted a seed and then it kind of just grew from there. And I'm very fortunate that um, the council of the day, uh, when I was planning, I liked a lot of the things they were doing. They were... Uh, there was a lot of really good people and doing good things. And I felt like I could just be an addition to that, that it, it didn't have to be a negative change campaign. It was just that maybe I could bring some more to the picture. Now, I've had the pleasure to vote for myself twice in my lifetime, once municipal, well, twice municipally and once federally. And walking into that ballot box and seeing your name on that ballot is a surreal experience in itself. And, um, for someone who grew up around politics, who grew up volunteering, who grew up with your a father who was engaged, walking into that ballot box, I can imagine, or voting online or however they were doing it at the time, because every province is different. For you, what was that moment like seeing your name and putting your trust in, at the end of the day, you've done all you can do and You've knocked in as many doors as you possibly can, and the voters now get to decide if you are worthy enough to sit at that council table. It was uh, the day of voting. I remember riding my bike over and, you know, casting my ballot. And I, I voted early because I always vote early. And it was it was kind of surreal. Like, you walked into this room, and I'm like, I'm working my own name. Like, this is kind of crazy. It's wild. But um, 
it felt good. It, it was the right timing for my family, I think for the community, for my voice. Um, all things kind of aligned that day. I will say that when I was driving home the first time and saw we have low heat highways, kind of our major highway, and a four foot photo of myself uh, was something else. That was, it was a little terrifying. And uh, one of our neighbors who lives closest to the high school uh, asked for a sign. So I planted one of the yard signs and she messaged me and she's like, what is this? I want the big one. So we went back and we put the big one on her lawn and I had to pass it almost every day when I was going to the high school to coach or, or whatever, <laughs> pick it up. And, you know, you see yourself and you're like, wow, like you, you start to almost like disassociate. Like it's, it's not me, but it is me. Like it was, it was a bit surreal. I won't lie. And I will say that I had a moment at UBCM, which is the big municipal convention that happened in September. I was there early for a session I walked in and there's this big waterfall and they put UBCM and lights on it and looking around and you're just like, wow, like, how did this happen? Like it, it, it was, a, there's these moments where you're just like, holy cow, didn't have this necessarily planned, but it, it's, it's a wild ride. <laughs> so you've been in office now for just over a year, a year and a few weeks after, as of recording this interview, um, and I can imagine that being an outside perspective, uh, outside observer of municipal politics, and then actually being on the other side of that council table and making the decisions is quite eye opening for especially people who don't have that experience, like some new candidates. For you, what was that big learning curve for yourself to make sure that you were prepared and you are still going to be able to do your job correctly? Actually, I want to rephrase that here for a second, if that's okay. What was the biggest learning curve for you from a new counselor's perspective? And are you still learning on the job as of today? Oh, absolutely. Uh, easily learning on the job as of today. I, I love learning. Like that is my favorite thing. And if I could have been a student forever, I would have. But um, I'm continually like searching out podcasts or searching out um, webinars and things that I can learn more bike lanes or, or emergency preparedness. And so when they offer the sessions at conventions, like that's that's my jam. I'm in there and I want to learn. So um, when we get our agenda packages each week or we get reports, that's where that's where I feel like I, I just love it. That's the the highlight. I learned that. Um, and listening to the feedback from the community, to me, that is that is huge. Like that's how I make my decisions. I would say that biggest eye opener, I had a really I had a pretty good idea of the job. A lot of people will ask, oh, did it was, was it what you expected? Yeah, it is. I, I felt fairly sure that I knew what I was getting into and I'd say it was pretty accurate. But I would say that my biggest did the weight of the decisions, the, the heaviness of making that decision is probably the biggest eye opener. And like everything that comes before us, I take very seriously and I do my homework and I ask questions and I want to have the, we're, we're very lucky in Pitt Meadows. We have a very engaged community and they will email and they will stop you at the grocery store and they'll come to council. And that to me helps when I hear those voices comboed with wonderful staff at City Hall who will answer my questions when I fire them off, even last minute that they pop into my head. But I would say, you know, the the actual, the seriousness of the, the things that you're making decisions on and, and thinking about the future of those decisions and how you could affect. And it's, it's not that I didn't think this, the decisions would be serious. I think that just sort of the, the bigger picture of like, my voice is an important part of it. You must have listened to my show once or twice because you, you've just picked up on a question that I'm about to ask you when I asked the flat question, I follow up with this is you do have a weight on your shoulders and it's a very important weight because the decisions you make impact your residents the day after you make them. The decisions you make the next day, people are feeling those impacts, whether it be service levels, whether it be a budget, this, that, or the other, zoning ball house, you make them, you are the government of proximity, according to Scott Pierce, president of FCM. And that weighs on people because you have to live in your community. You don't go to Victoria to do your job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You were in Pitt Meadows the entire time. For you, how important is it to be prepared when you walk into that council meeting? 
but not be cemented in the way that you are going to vote because something might be said in that council meeting that may change your mind. That absolutely. So I, the importance of preparation to me, um, my other job and some of my schooling is in emergency preparedness. So I am that person who is, I like to know all the potential outcomes, right? And so I will, I do my research. That's, that's the one thing I love. I will read all the things, ask all the questions, but I am so thankful that I have this council that um, when we're just debating something, if someone has a really important point of view to me that maybe I haven't thought of, they're really good, uh, especially if they have specialty in that area of, of telling us in council chambers so we can make a decision. And it's happened. I've gone in there sort of thinking I'm going to go one way. And then you hear something and you're like, wow, like that's a really good point of view. Or maybe a citizen has said something or staff. So I'm never like, 110 percent there's always the probability that like or possibility that someone could say something and you just hadn't thought of that point of view but i'm so thankful that our council is really really um open to explaining their decisions and and their point of view and taking a moment to speak about how they're going to vote and that that really helps on the flip side of that you i'm assuming you engage with residents as well uh, on particular contentious issues and i'm assuming there might have been a few i'm not 100 percent sure but i would say that there's probably a few that you can look back on and go yeah there was a few contentious ones how important is it to get outside your echo chamber as well because everyone has their social media feeds and everyone has their abilities to engage with their friends or those people that they meet for wine or coffee on a weekly basis but you need to hear from everyone and people who may challenge you on issues. How important of the is it for you in the job to make sure that you're not just listening to the people who are yes men? And you know what? It's huge. Uh, I think that's really, really important. And I love that when we're out in Pitt Meadows and I'm going to the grocery store, someone might stop me. And that's that's okay. I, I actually really kind of enjoy it. And we don't always agree. And maybe they have the right facts or maybe there's an aspect they haven't told me. But I'm also very fortunate that like my tight friend group is is not really political. So I have this little group that I can go to and sort of be free of the politics. And that's really nice when you need that break. But um, I think it's really important to engage with people with different point of views. You might not agree, but you need to hear that point of view. You need to hear that maybe the way you're looking at it isn't the same as everybody else or it's it is the same and it needs to be different and we have such a vocal community that I'm I'm so fortunate that you do tend to get that spectrum and and I would argue that our council has a spectrum too which is nice and I think that that gives a proper representation and, and I hope that we can we can usually work to a good answer at the end of the day. Now, I, I, you seem to enjoy people coming up and talking to you, but I've got to ask the personal question, do the kids enjoy when mom gets pulled aside for when they're out at the dance club or out at the grocery store and I say, mom, we just came for milk. We don't need to spend two hours. <laughs> I'm I'm lucky. So my kids are 16 and 14 now. So if we're up at the grocery store, they're just like, I'm just going to go to aisle three and I'm going to get what I need and they can go. And and so I think it would be harder if they were littler. But um, now they they can sort of engage or not engage. Um, one of my children is my younger is is kind of politically activated. He's vocal. He has lots of opinions. The other one is not as interested and that's OK. And they kind of just do their own thing or partake in the conversation if they are interested, which is actually, it's a pretty cool thing to see happen. So while, while engagement is good and making the decision is probably the toughest part of the job because you have to wear those decisions. And sometimes they may not go in the way that you vote or the way that you want, but they are the decision of the majority of the council. How important we talk about the importance of the role, but how important is it to be respectful to people who want, and your honest, unfiltered a response of why you vote a certain way, because I can imagine a hundred percent of the people are not going to agree with a hundred percent of the votes you've taken, but you as an elected official have to give them your time and effort to sort of ensure that they are aware of why you did what you did. And I think that with our, with our pretty contentious issues, um, what I really like to do, we have a comment before we vote and, and we can say, so I try to explain how I got to my opinion and whether yeah. that be search 
who I've heard from and listened to and how I form my opinion. And I think that in the council chamber, if you're able to really lay down your groundwork and your explanation, I, I've been fortunate that most people haven't um, been really upset about anything yet. You will get some emails um, and that's fine. And I think that as long as you can articulate, you know, how you got to your point of view, I hope that people can see that my decisions are made on, on facts and the community in mind, regardless of whether you're a friend or I know you or, I've, or you voted for me, my job is to represent the whole community as a whole. And so I, I really try to make those decisions as a whole and for our future as a community and a city. So um, I have not too many too many really big hot topics. Some people disagree, but it's always been um, very cordial and, and they might disagree and that's okay, but at least we can get to a point of why are we were disagreeing. You've talked about how Pitt Meadow, in your words, is engaged. People are willing to give their opinions on certain issues. People are willing to give feedback. People are, and shockingly, and this is what probably the first time I've heard this on the show, are showing up to council meetings, which I, I don't hear a lot about across Canada when I'm doing these interviews. But I want to talk about something that I think is a very interesting aspect of municipal government. And it is the apathy that comes with municipal government or the misunderstanding of the jurisdictional roles that the municipal government has to play in the grand scheme of a democracy. When people are engaging with you, are they engaging on the issues that are in the actual municipal jurisdictional roles? Or are they talking about provincial issues? Are they talking about federal issues, school board issues? Is there an understanding in Pitt Meadows that wastewater, sewage, Roads, infrastructure is a municipal issue, healthcare, school board, provincial issue, passports, federal issue, or are they just wanting someone to fix their issue no matter who, what level of government it is? And I like, I think it goes both ways. There's lots of time where people are very informed in Pitt Meadows and they will, they know who to go to. Um, they go to council for municipal issues and, and I feel fortunate for that and I'm happy to coordinate or comment on that. Um, do they come to us sometimes for a pro provincial issue or actually sometimes it'll even be an RCMP issue that is is policing more than it is, you know, city. So um, sometimes that happens, but they're usually like we our staff and CAO, they do a really good job of directing them to the right resource. So at the end of the day, they're usually directed to the right person. And that's OK. Sometimes you start with what you know in here in Pitt Meadows and we can get you to the right place. Um, sometimes they come to us and ask for advocacy, which I think is, is part of our role to reach out to the province, to reach out to Ottawa and say that this is what my city needs and these are your areas, but you need to hear our voices. And so sometimes going to the wrong spot gets you to the right spot and, and that's okay too. Um, but I would argue that most Pitt Meadows residents are very they're well informed and, and and they hit it usually pretty on the target. For them, good for Pitt Meadows. That's all I can say. I, I want to turn to my next the second segment of the show. And before I do this, I'm going to preface this conversation with this statement. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion. So, Councillor, in your opinion, as of recording this interview, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues uh, facing Pitt Meadows today? Ooh, easy. Our <laughs> number one priority, um, Harris Road train crossing and the underpass that we we need at the end of the day. So um, we have CP, uh, a rail that comes right through sort of the center of our town, and it divides our main street, Harris Road. Um, and it blocks traffic on Harris Road two and a half to three hours a day. And they are putting in a third line because um, they have land, crown land, that they can put a third line in. And it will increase those stoppages to seven hours a day. And so seven hours of being unable to use our main street, essentially. Uh, it's huge to us. I mean, that is economically speaking um, for businesses along that corridor for workers getting to work, for our commutes in and out of the city, and, and arguably for safety. Um, it is the top 3%, in the top 3% most dangerous crossing in Canada. It, it's an at-grade crossing right now, and um, it's it's scary because you're, you're crossing, you're in traffic, there's trains, 
we're very fortunate that we haven't had a, a major incident. There have been some smaller ones, but it, it's 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 a scary crossing. And I think that it inhibits everyone's ability to flow here in Pitt Meadows and do what we want to do. And um, it's it's a concern. And so what happened was in 2017, uh, the Vancouver Port Authority and CP came to this council of the day and said, we would like to make an underpass because we know that this is a stress on you. So, which it's, it's beneficial to keep those trains going for not just pit meadows and because they're building a, a logistics park, but it's a trade corridor for the lower mainland, the province, if not the whole country, um, everything, millions of dollars come and go through pit meadows on a train every day. So CP and the port, the port was leading the project and these designs were amazing. I was on the active transportation advisory committee at the time, and we got to include bike paths and how we were going to build those in. And it's, it's a beautiful project. It was, uh, I think it was estimated at 65 million at the time. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, I laugh away. because I know that number is going to be much higher in 2023, but it's sad so, that it's so much higher. And, and, you know, with inflation, with, all the delays of COVID, but also there were like um, in Pit Meadows, there were they did the ground, and it was it was going to be more complicated to build this with the ground. And I, I'm not an expert or an engineer, but I guess it was much more complicated. And um, the price ballooned to over 195 million, is my understanding. And yeah, like three times. <laughs> For those oh, who are not watching this episode, I just gave the Wiley Coyote eyes popping out going, what? 195? Wow. Okay. Yeah. And and so work was done um, by the ports and by CP to try and secure more funding and shift funding from other projects. But there was a gap and the gap was over 50 million. And they came to our council in March and said, would you guys fund it? And Man, there were some sleepless nights, I will tell you, because my city needs this underpass for us, for safety. I mean, getting ambulance and fire across and police across, we need this. It's 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 so important. I, I don't even have the words to express how much it means to our community. But that meant tax dollars. It meant going to um, an ascent of the elector. And basically every house in Pitt Meadows was going to owe about $9,000. So we looked at $300 a year for 30 years on your taxes, if you want to put it that way. Um, and what it also did was it really handcuffed our city. So if we were to borrow that a large amount of money, there was other projects we aren't going to be able to get to do because there would be debt by the city um, and to pay back. And so, you know, we would be really stalled. There's, there's lots that we need in this city. And so uh, we looked at it. I know we need the underpass, I know that, but putting it on the residents' backs of Pitt Meadows when it is such an important trade corridor that essentially is so important to our whole country felt very unfair. It felt, and, and so we had a vote. We had a very short time period. They wanted us to officially sign on right away. And um, there was kind of like a, a $5 million, you sign on, yes. And if the project doesn't go, you don't get that back. <laughs> deposit and yeah and so I felt very uncomfortable with that too five million in my community is big and and so with just all the unknowns still um our council voted and we've we we had an open house and we engaged the community but we voted unanimously no not to take on that debt um was that heartbreaking because now our project is has, has sort of stalled essentially yeah uh, there was a lot of sleepless nights. There was a lot of like, it's, it's the number one topic when you're out on Halloween and you're walking around your neighborhood, it's how's the underpass. And so, but I will say this much, um, our mayor is just, that's, that's like, she just keeps going. She is on this. We are talking at UBCM, our minister meetings. Um, she's sort of advocated, we just released a whole bunch of letters to ministers, um, really, really asking them to consider for the funding, as well as we have the support of the Metro Vancouver mayors. Like they have all written in and said, yes, this is important, not just for Pitt Meadows, but for everyone. So the background work, while it sort of seems like you don't see any shovels digging on Harris Road, it is happening in the background. And so there's a lot of advocacy, our staff, our mayor, it hasn't stopped. 
but is absolutely our number one biggest issue. So I'm going to play in the sandbox for a little bit, if you don't mind. And I'm going to sort of, because for those who are listening outside of Pitt Meadows, they may not know this, but maybe you'll be able to rant or ra ramble this off very quickly. Um, you're talking about a project that seems to be a, a priority for this council. You're talking about an underpass that could be, if not complete it, uh, up to a seven hour a day wait or seven hours per day where the main street of your community is completely closed down, which is would be horrendous for any community, let alone the entrance into the lower mainland BC. Uh, while there's a third line still coming in, I'm assuming, I'm going to assume that, they're probably not stopping that work. They're probably still going ahead with that work. So what do you see as, while the advocacy work is great, while you need to advocate for more funding from the provincial and federal governments, you're stuck left holding the back. You're st mm -hmm. stuck there going, okay, we voted against it. We had our reasons to do that because we didn't want to put it on the backs of our residents. But now our residents are asking, what's next? So I'm going to ask the semi-million dollar, well, literally the $50 million question here is, what does Pitt Meadows do in the short term to alleviate some of these potential stoppages in your main corridor until an underpass is built? Oh, and that is that is the difficult. <laughs> um, we we do have another exit on the south yeah. of Meadows and Airport Way. Um, it was just widened to two lanes. And one of the unfortunate parts is it bottlenecks at a, a roundabout that is not owned by the city. So we are also advocating for having that situation resolved. And uh, I mean, we're trying to improve in terms of signage and, and safety and awareness um, because the crossing itself is dangerous for pedestrians, for cyclists, all of that. And, and right now, I mean, those measures, sure, they, they feel like a bit of a Band-Aid. Like we are doing our best to make it known, to get the word out. And and I would say that, again, like our mayor has been so instrumental in, in sort of gathering other cities to really promote it too. But at the city level at this point, we either plan a route around or we sit at the crossing. <laughs> So as we have listeners in Ottawa, and for some reason, we have an amazing amount of listeners in the uh, Ottawa hub, and I mean right downtown Ottawa, because we look at the algorithms on a weekly basis. What would you want from the federal government? And I know I'm asking you as the councillor, and I know this is more uh, you're looking at the provincial government right now, but the federal government can come to the table as well with this help, because they're mm -hmm. always looking to potentially hand out money. So is are you looking at the federal government for help as well? Or is this more of a just provincial matter and you're looking at uh, Premier Eby to come to the table with $50 million or probably a little bit more now after everything that we've gone through since March? But are you looking at both governments or are you just, is it more provincial government that you're looking at? Um, I mean, if anyone wants to give us 50 million, I'm pretty sure, well, not anyone, but like, I'm, I'm sure we'd be willing to take it from either source, but um, no, it's definitely been both. We, we've talked to the provincial government, but realistically, do we feel this is a federal issue? I, I believe so. It's a, it's a corridor with goods it's, that go it's through. Literally it's literally CP. It's literally the Canadian. CP. So Absolutely. Um, there have been trips to Ottawa. There's been minister meetings. So absolutely. Uh, I know our, our MP also spoke about it. So uh, we're hitting all levels, all levels. Perfect. Now, outside of this major infrastructure project, which seems pretty, let, let's be honest, the probably the most precise issue I've ever been told on this show. Usually it's a big, very macro, but this is a very micro issue, but it's a macro issue as well. What other issues do you see in the community that are going on right now? Or is there any other pressing issues right now that you are aware of? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, every community has issues and, and smaller ones or bigger ones. That's talk to a Pit Meadows resident and they will tell you that's number one. So we're working on it. It's big. It some days feels all encompassing, but we're we're doing our best. Uh, we have other issues for sure. So, so I want to pick up on that for a second, because it's a very important thing that you just said there. Residents, this will be their number one issue, but they, they're going to have other issues as well. And while this is time consuming, and I can imagine this is very time consuming for this council, 
you have to deal with the here and now as well and the issues that are affecting your residents. How do you balance and how does this council balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual as well to ensure that people aren't being left behind, that aren't being le uh, forgotten about and their issues are being addressed while the city is still trying to undertake a massive infrastructure project like this underpass? And man, that's a tough one. There's there's lots of balls in the air, right? So you're working on the underpass, but I would say our council has still really forged ahead with a lot of really good projects and communication with our citizens, our staff. I mean, yeah, we're we're leaning into them. They know that this is this is Pit Meadows moment where we really have to dig in. And um, we're very fortunate. We have wonderful staff, and I would say our mayor is is has been working overtime. I know she's putting in the hours. So um, some of the issues that we've seen so far. So when elected, we had uh, firefighting from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then we relied on voluntary volunteer firefighters paid on call from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So we've never had full-time fire in Pitt Meadows. But our council was elected. Uh, we were all pretty public safety oriented. We we really put an emphasis on that. And that was a pretty big issue. It was one of the topic debate topics in Pitt Meadows of moving to a 24-7 um, professional full-time firefighting. And uh, it was one of the first things we tackled. And even during this underpass issue, we dug in and we have now as of june 5th we had 24 7 fire and that was one of my my probably i slept great that night uh, i was the, it was this brief this breath of relief that we we had really done something for our community and uh, we're so thankful to the existing firefighters because we went from eight to 16 and uh, or to, yeah 16 so we doubled our fire department which is a huge task. Um, we had these trainees who had to hop in there and get trained really quick. We had the, the existing crews who had to help train these people. It was, it was a, a concerted effort. And we're so thankful to our firefighters because now we can sort of take a breath and go, okay, we're good there. We, we still have work to do. It needs to grow still. But it was this momentous leap to 24 hour service. And that was something that was deeply important to me and to a lot of people in our community. And I think that we feel, I, I feel, and I think that they feel safer having 24 hour fire service. I, I'm very cautious of time here. And I, I just want to make sure I get this out of the way because I've been accused on this show and I say this a lot over the last few weeks, but I've been accused on this show of only talking about the negatives that are happening in a community. And I want to ask a very important flip question to my issues. What's Pitt Meadows doing right? What do you point to when you go to UBCM and you go to talk to municipal leaders from across British Columbia or even across Canada and you say, you might be doing it great. Pitt Meadows doing it better. What's that? What are those issues? What are those priorities that Pitt Meadows gets right at the end of the day? I would say that public safety is probably something we're very proud of. I know that we are all very proud that we moved to this 24 hour service and yes, there's room to grow and we have more work to do, but that was a big one. Um, we also opened a brand new fire hall just before we went to 24 hour service. Um, we are working on getting our own autonomous RCMP. So we, now we share that with Maple Ridge, which is like right across from us. Um, it's called the Ridge Meadows RCMP, but I have, I have family in Maple Ridge. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Not far. <laughs> and so um, we will have our own RCMP in here in Pitt Meadows. And I think that's really important. Um, it's something that we've done. We're going to do well, that we can really tailor what that police force looks like to this community. We have different needs than the communities around us. And I think for the, the money that we're going to spend, which all, all of the studies said that we'd be better off on our own, believe it or not, that we're going to see a, a better use of our police service here. And it's going to be good. Not that, and we love Ridge Meadows RCMP, but I think that, and they agreed that splitting was going to be a good thing for Pitt Meadows. That's something we're doing really well. Um, I would say that, you know what, our council as a whole, something that was really important to the voters that we kept hearing was decorum, professionalism, you don't always have to agree, but you don't have to get into name calling, cat fighting, that kind of thing. So um, 
I am so lucky that the people I serve with, we don't always agree. We vote differently, but the level of just working together towards a common goal. At the end of the day, we're going to do what's best for Pitt Meadows. And sometimes your vote is right and or right or goes ahead or is not. But we all know that at the core, the person has the best interest in Pitt Meadows in mind. And it's good to have a spectrum and, and differing opinions and it's okay but we, we kind of genuinely like each other. Like <laughs> we all get along. And when we go to conferences and stuff, we sit at the same table and we, we text message and walk there. We carpool places. And I think that seeing that people can disagree at a council chamber with a vote, but that we see the good in the person and we can appreciate where they're coming from and that we just are, have the ability to keep things professional and um, some people will disagree with this, but kind, kind is good too. And, and at the end of the day, when we make this vote and we disagree, it's gone. We move on and, and we go back to getting work done. Now you've been in the position for just, just over a year now, and you have three years left in your first term. And I know it's always hard to put yourself in a time machine and say, okay, I'm going to put myself into the next election and decide if I'm going to run for reelection or just walk away after first term. What do you see as your priority over the next three years that if you woke up the day before the nomination date in Pitt Meadows in the next election, you say, I got it done. I've left Pitt Meadows a better place. What would you, what would you, what would that issue be for the next three years for yourself and not for council, but for yourself to get accomplished? Oh, you know what? I think before, if you'd asked me this a year ago, it probably would have been the fire <laughs> because <laughs> I was I was very passionate about that. That was something that meant a lot to me. And while we still have work to do, we we it was a step in the right direction. Um, man, now you know it's it's really important for me to see the Pitt Meadows Autonomous RCMP when we get this set up and running. Um, it's really important for me to see that tailored to our community and working smoothly and really giving them the police resources and, and service that our citizens deserve. So those were two really big issues to me. Um, obviously, if I saw that underpass go in, I would feel pretty good about myself. I would like not just me, the whole city, I would feel, feel pretty accomplished. But you know, there's lots of little things that that still need to be done. And, um, you know, we, our council's done a lot. Like we changed, we had this uh, Pit, Miss Pitt Meadows Day and it was, you know, the, the crown and the cape and the frilly dresses and had been that way forever. But our council decided that we were going to be a little more progressive and we changed the name to the Pitt Meadows Youth Ambassadors and we took the gender out of it. You could be anything and, and, and volunteer. And we really wanted to make them more than just the Pitt Meadows Day. We've incorporated them all year round. And that was something that I just, I know. And I'm watching um, the, we have like a leader in the group, the, the, the sort of head of that group, but watching some of them step up when the, the, the leading one couldn't be there. And uh, one of them spoke at Canada Day and it was, it was moving. It was to watch a youth be empowered to step up and speak to the crowd and, and seeing that we're really doing something good there to make it open and break down sort of the barriers that some kids would have had for applying that program. That one was another checkbox for me. So I just see these little things um, keep coming. And I, every time a little thing keeps coming, I want to do one more and one more. And so I don't know if there'll ever be like a one issue that would make me go, I'm done, I'm out, but um, not yet, at least not yet. I'm going to kind of ask a very personal question right now. And I apologize if this comes out of left field, but in the 40 minutes that we've been talking, it seems that you are truly wanting the betterment of your community. You are engaged with your community. You are actively looking for solutions for your community and I'm going to bring up something you talked about a little bit earlier. Your dad. Your dad was engaged in his community as well. He wanted the betterment of the community. Unfortunately, he didn't get to see you on this council. Do you think he'd be impressed of how you've handled yourself over the last year? Uh, I think that we would have had some great discussions. <laughs> I think that some of the things would have been awesome to be able to bounce across him and then get his feedback and how he would suggest looking at um he always had a different pers sort of perspective sometimes than I did 
And I think it's tough because you're like, you sit there and you're like, some days like, what would he think? Right? Like it would be really interesting. Um, he wouldn't have been interested in social media or, you know, any of that. He probably would have looked at Is like, anyone yeah. really a, a fan of social media? <laughs> Oh, it's the necessary evil, right? We got to do it. And I think that I like to think at the end of the day, he would have been, regardless of the decisions I make and whether we would have agreed or not agreed, I think he would have been proud of the fact that I stepped into this role and stepped up and asked to be voted for, which is kind of out of my normal realm of comfort um, in previous careers. So I, I'm a 911 dispatcher. I sit behind a phone. No one sees me. So to be out in public and, and sort of ask for those votes was was challenging for me. So um, I think he would have been really proud. I, I, I take a lot of solace in that, that he would have be very, very proud. You, you talked also about how one of your children is politically active and willing to give their opinion from time to time. After a year in office, would you ever recommend it to your children to get into the political realm if they came up to you and said, Mom, I'm thinking about it? You know what? And, I, and maybe this is naive because I'm only a year in. <laughs> but, you know, it is it is validating when you see the things get done. When you see those moments where you're like, man, we worked and we voted on that. And that was an issue that we hit. And, and here it is happening. And June 5th, you know, all of a sudden we had 24 hour fire service and I went, Ooh, like, wow, like that's big. And so, and then watching the Pitt Meadows ambassadors get up the youth ambassadors and seeing them out in the community. So you see these little things you're doing, which I think is super cool. And I think that's something that's really municipal about the position. Um, you get to see it firsthand. And so I, if, if they came to me, I think that they've seen enough in the background of, you know, me growing gray hairs over an overpass and stressing and sleepless nights and all the work that they see me do in terms of reading and information and um, working through my decisions, I think they'd be well informed. I think that I would, I would probably encourage them to do it because, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting position to be in. You, you get all sorts of information at you. You got to make these decisions. And genuinely, I feel like they've trusted me with those decisions. That means a lot to me. And, and I would honestly think that my children see that they see that, that, you know, I'm entrusted with making a decision and how important it is. And I think that, um, you know, if either of them, who knows, the older one might get into it too. Um, but I, I wouldn't hesitate to encourage them at this point. Now, we have listeners across Canada, and there are some municipalities that are going to be heading to provincial, uh, not provincial, municipal elections in the next year. Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, uh, and a few others that are currently off the top of my head. I can't remember for the love of me. But what advice would you give to a potential first-term counselor who is looking at potentially doing what you did and just getting involved and sort of making a difference? What advice would you give them prior to putting their name on that ballot? Um, do your research, right? Like make sure you're educated on the topics. And sometimes that's hard to do because, you know, like there's, there's private and held back information, but the more educated you are on the topic, the more that you've really dug in, the easier it is to express your opinion and the easier it is to articulate that op opinion and your decisions to people who come up to you or ask you or at events. And uh, absolutely my number one is just be yourself. Like I, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. I know that. And I don't expect everyone to vote for me, but at the end of the day, I'm the same person at home with my kids, coaching volleyball, working as I am at council. And I think we need more of that. We need more of the representation of just everyone at council, but also just a real person and be genuine. And if you, if people relate to that, they, they'll probably vote for you. But if you don't get voted in, there's probably something else on your horizon coming your way. I want to turn to my last subject here because I am cautious of time and I know you are a busy person. So I want to talk about my favorite subject, and that is tourism. I love tourism. I think more Canadians should spend their economic dollars here in Canada in great communities and not potentially go visit Cancun. Not saying that don't go visit Cancun. Maybe if they want to sponsor the show, I'll go to Cancun. But right now I'm spending my dollars in Canada in some great municipalities. 
for people who are listening to this and potentially myself, who's going to be coming to Pitt Meadows, hopefully next year sometime, what are some of the tourist hotspots? What are the hidden gems of your community that you say, this is what you need to see? Oh, and that is, that's our nature. We are so for, we're the, we're the natural place and we are embedded in these like gorgeous spots. So we have a, a really great, great dike system that is walking, cycling, running, and it goes from river from wooded right out onto the rivers. We were surrounded by three rivers and one of those, the Alouette, uh, paddle boarding, kayaking, fishing. Um, we are so fortunate to have that five minutes from my house. I go often is, uh, it's my favorite it's very relaxing so we have these wonderful natural hot spots and you know they're sort of like passive recreation in that sense we love having people come here and experience that and I think that our city um I would like to see us personally sort of lean into that a bit more and maybe you know we saw during the pandemic how hard it was to get a parking spot near those things so maybe um look into really encouraging that and maybe being prepared in case there is an influx and, you know, trying to capitalize on it, maybe work with, we've seen a lot of the bike rentals for people who maybe can't bring their bike out this way, but they could ride if they were rented and just ways of increasing exposure. Um, we also have a fabulous airport. Our, we share our airport with Maple Ridge. It's gorgeous. It just got a complete reno. They've redone the actual runways and they've built a brand new terminal. We're just like, it's a hot portal for coming to Pitt Meadows. They do at the actual place, we have a, a cafe that's now licensed. So you can sit and watch planes come and go with arguably one of the most beautiful views you will ever have. And I just think going to visit the airport is super cool. We used to take the kids all the time, watch the planes and the helicopters, but there's businesses all surrounding it. And one of them does uh, helicopter tours, sky helicopters. And so you can actually take a tour and they'll take you all over Pitt Meadows. I was fortunate enough to get to do one. And Lucky. <laughs> being able, oh, it was amazing. It was the best day. And you can see Pitt Meadows and the mountains and the lakes um, from this helicopter. And it's just one of the neatest businesses. And I think... Um, for tourism to come to Pitt Meadows, you've got an airport, you've got these tours, and then we also have agriculture tours. So we are 78% agriculture in Pitt Meadows, and one of our arguably most famous spots is Hopcott Farms, and they have a bistro on site with a grocery store, and I know it's it's some of the best food, and we we love them. There, you, you do realize I'm just touring the place. I'm not coming to live there, right? And you're pitching this like, come live to Pit Meadows. <laughs> well, that's why I live here. I love it, and I and I'm I'm always like number one Pit Meadows cheerleader because I genuinely love living here. We've had uh, the ability potentially to move into subdivided family things and other cities and. No, we chose Pit Meadows. We're not going anywhere. We love it. But if you come, you have to go to Hopcott. They do a cranberry tour. If you're here at the right time of the year, you get to get in with the waiters. You learn all about our cranberries. And because that's our that's one of our biggest uh, producers here. And so um, it's it's just neat. Um, yes, I love cranberry. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, this is not going to end well for me <laughs> when I tell my husband we're going to Pit Meadows to go wade in cranberries. Oh. Anyway, I want to end on a million dollar question. And it's kind of the most important question of the show, because I think every municipal leader needs to be able to answer this. I think they do, but I like to have it on the record. So that way people know what they truly think. In your opinion, what makes Pit Meadows such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family it's it's the people hands down we have the best community vibe connection um we when someone needs something in pit meadows we come together and we make it happen and whether they post it on facebook or we have community forums and things I cannot explain the community feel and so when we hurt we've had some tragedies we all hurt and when we have good moments, we all have good moments. And I, I just, I I grew up in a different city. Um, it was also small, but I, this is, it's a different vibe. I don't really know how to put it into words other than we're connected. And 
it is just such a wonderful community feel. Allison, I want to thank you so much. I truly want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down. Uh, I know we said uh, the uh, social media is evil, but this is how we connect it. And I appreciate you actually re uh, getting back to me and saying yes to participate in the show. Because I think, and I, I just know you now for about 45 minutes, close to an hour. I, I have the sense that you're doing this for the right reason. And I don't think municipal politicians get thanked enough. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for serving your community. Thank you for being part of your community. And thank you for advocating for your community. Because it seems like you have a lot of things going on, particularly an underpass. But it seems like Pitt Meadows is better served with you and the council at the table. So thank you so much. Thank you. That, that means a lot to me. Thank you for joining us today for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date on the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support either. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering you the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of this community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues what truly matter to you and to our communities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.